you are able to tra trade hats, change hats, and direct or DP. Absolutely. But I, I actually DP the work that I direct also. My two, the two features that I directed and all the shorts that I've directed, I'm, I, do, I'm doing a, I do a lot of shorts also, I direct and DP them. You are the Canadian Steven Zutterberg. <laughs> well, there's a lot of them. All the young, all the young uh, directors do that now also. But, uh, but for my next feature that I will direct, I think it's going to be too big for me to, to actually DP. <laughs> We are honored today to have with us um, one of Canada's most unique and tremendous cinematic talents, André Toppé. Although I know your feature work, which is tremendous, and I'd like to talk about it specifically too and get into the details of it. Well, I started, uh, I, I studied film school, yeah. and after film school I was really lucky because uh, I studied in Concordia. And the two years, the two years in Concordia were very strong, my, my, my year and the year before us. And like everybody works in the film industry now, DPs, directors, lots of them, like seriously, in the television industry also. So that's how we started working right after school. We, uh, we started our own companies and made music videos like shitload, like every two weeks, every week. We make them for a thousand bucks to 80,000 bucks. Some favorites of yours would be? Oh, so much crap. But uh, <laughs> I, that's where I met Denis Villeneuve and I started doing uh, music videos with Denis Villeneuve. Actually, we did one for Cirque du Soleil, which was really beautiful. And uh, yeah, and um, Daniel Belanger, local talents, no big, no big, uh, big names and nothing really interesting. But we, we shot a lot and we experimented a lot. And, and at, at the, the same, same time, we started shooting, shooting our own features. And we, instead of doing the regular thing that was being done in Quebec at that time, which was hiring the people from the industry, we made our features for no money and we hired our friends. Right. It sort of clashed with the industry. Because, it, I mean, we really came in strong and a couple of years later we got noticed and we started getting the money from the government. Right. From Telefilm and Sodec, uh, which is the Quebec uh, yeah. Cultural Ministry. Was there a name given to this posse, this group, or was it just... Six of us together, we made a, a film, a collective film called uh, Cosmos. Mm -hmm. Uh, it was a black and white uh, collective film, and it went to Cannes for its night, uh, director's fortnight. And that's when we started being called the new wave uh, of Quebec new wave. New wave yeah, right. I, but then the, the new directors today are also called new, new wave, Quebec <laughs> new wave. It's funny how the new waves just keep rolling in. There's another <laughs> new wave. <laughs> so I also shot my own features as a director, and uh, then I made kids, and I decided that I wanted to to be with them. And when you're shooting three features a year, you can't be with the kids that much. So that's when I started doing commercials. And I decided to do, I do, I shoot four, five, or six days of commercial a month. And every year and a half, I, I, I do a feature. And the rest of the time, I spend writing my own features. I remember working with the gentleman behind the camera to my left. Um, we were making our first short film. And so all of a sudden, this, this whole conversation about film stocks came up. And I was like, what do you mean there's different film stocks? How does that work? And this was our film school. And I happened across this film called Maelstrom. And like, wow, what a picture. It's just, it just su such a riveting story, uh, intermingling characters that, that converged. Just, can you just tell us about what you were doing when it came to the talking fish sequences that emerged throughout versus the, the photography and the rest of the movie. Because to my mind, when I'm watching it, those, there's probably about you know, maybe five minutes of, of, of the, 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 the layer with the fishmonger and the, to, the, the talking fish. And it was like this rich, deep, very dark and, and, uh, and uh, sort of brash photography. And then the rest of the film, although the rest of the film had a whole bunch of different looks depending on the story, uh, and I remember sev several different color palettes, if I'm yeah. not mistaken. There was one that was very blue, and one that was very... So can you talk a little bit about like, what, you were, what you were going for in the movie and what technique... Sure. So when we did the Maelstrom, we, before any, doing any films, with most of the directors, but especially with Denis, we, at one point we sit down and we, we screen 20 films together. I mean, fast forward to different films and just talk about... And the reason about aesthetics and about contrast and about lenses, movements, mise-en-scene, whatever, 
And the reason for that is very simply just to get the right vocabulary down. And doing that uh, with Denis, uh, we stumbled upon a film by Wong Kar Wai, which was Happy Together. Uh -huh. And uh, we just didn't understand. You know, he was talking to, we, we looked like well, there's a, a sequence in Argentina where there's the waterfalls and a lot of water, and the water was so black. We both loved it very much, but at one point I said, you know, we're going to go and shoot water, I'm going to expose negative, and it's never going to look like that. There's something happening here. There's something wrong here. This is not right. really... So we had this guy from the NFB, Conrad Perrault, which is a, an old, the, 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 the guy that took care of the labs in the end of 60s, 70s, 80s, and part of 90s probably. Yeah. Uh, and NFB, he's the head chemist, you know, he's the brains behind wow. the NFB. He's, this guy is one in, in, in North America, there's like a couple, like in, you know, a couple in New York, a couple in Los Angeles. Like understands the stock. He understands the stock. He's tested everything. NFB was the greatest experimental place in the 70s, you know. Of course, with the films, with the animation, everything. Yeah. But also, you know, McLaren, they, but also testing. They, they, money was no object, so they tested. They, they ran, he, he, he ran this lab like a, a wild chemist, you know. So we had, happy together, we had a print brought down um, from a distributor. This guy, Conrad Perrault, he looked at it twice and he said, yeah, I think I know what they did. I think I've done this before. Are you serious? That yeah. like, like that? Yeah, well, he, he said, I think, I think. So we're going to test it out. And we tested it out, and it was exactly the same. So what, what, what was it? Well, it was, uh, uh, it was in the intermediate. Uh, this is sort of, it's quite technical, but normally you take a... a, a no, no, interest, inter-negative, interpositive, yeah. Yeah, normally you take your neg, and you go to interpause, yeah. which is a special... Stock, interpause stock. That's it's usually an ISO of eight or something. Yeah, like. and it's low contrast and low grain yeah. and low sat because of the different generations. Then you go to interneg, it, there's a buildup of contrast, right? right? So there, these stocks are very low contrast stocks and low sat stocks. So that with the buildup, the natural buildup, it comes out. It'll come about the, the same. Print, yeah. Right? Okay. So what they did instead is they printed their neg on a regular copy. Regular film stock. Like almost like a print. Like, like a print stock. And then they took they it into their neck. They used that as, uh, as their interpause, and then they made an interneg, but a special interneg, a 5222, I believe it's called. It's, a, it's an interneg for um, animation, uh, animation stock. Uh -huh. Very saturated. And so the contrast level just goes way up, and the colors just go... They, 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 the colors are very rich, but... Anything, it's very dangerous because anything that's like, that's like uh, regularly exposed goes sort of mushy green and grainy, you know, so it's quite dangerous process, you know, it's really <laughs> sort of... So uh, how do you avoid that then? So we tested it and then we just, I said maybe we should just, there's a couple of things we did, but overexpose everything, uh, shoot nothing, no skin tone was was regularly exposed. It was a lot of lighting and it was um, at least overexposed by a stop and a half. Everything, like all the skin tones. And then anything that was just a half a stop or a stop under just went black. So it was quite dangerous sort of, <laughs> sort of way to work. Yeah. But so, and we, I used low-con filters on the lens to, because the contrast buildup was too much, you know, so I had to pull it back and I, I pulled the stock instead of exposing it normally. Quelqu'un par accident. Là, euh, la personne le sait, sauf moi. Personne? Non, personne. C'est quoi le problème? Moi, j'ai rien entendu. Hein? Vous voulez un sac? Si j'avais su, euh, vraiment pas d'affaires ici. Je savais pas non plus que mon père avait une voisine. Mon père vivait dans sa tête, les voisins sont rares dans ce temps-là. Le connaissez-vous depuis longtemps? Non. Depending on the way I lit it, made a huge difference. And this is what we did for the fish, to come back to your question, was we lit it very contrasty instead of going the regular formula because we wanted to give it a very stark look, like a very 
like a nightmarish type of look. Nightmarish. Well, that's, that is a fabulous story about the whole process of trying to get that. It's fabulous. There's one shot I want to ask you about because when I saw this shot, in, it, it, it was, uh, I was watching it on DVD, uh, but when I saw the shot, I thought, ah, this, I, I had to know whether it was your idea, whether it was Denise's idea, whether it was a collaborative thing, or whether it just hit at the last moment. I may be remembering this wrong, but the, uh, the female lead, one of the female leads is, is asleep on a couch. Yeah. And there's a big picture window, not unlike the one yeah. outside. Above yeah, her. Yeah, yeah, that's my idea. It was your idea. Because oh, you know what, the, <laughs> you the, the iris pole. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pull. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, cause, because that to me was the, one of the, I can count on, you know, both hands, the times that I've seen with one small camera technique, you're literally telling the story yeah, because yeah. we're exposed for the outside, you pull the iris, well, you tell, you tell what happens. Yeah, I mean. Well, the idea, actually, the idea, it was my idea, but it's not, it was a brilliant idea because it came out of a, of a, a technical uh, problem. As I, I, it's as too I, bright. <laughs> I mean, the the contrast level was so high on this on the final product. We knew about that while shooting that I could not control. I could not hold the city with detail and the inside. You wanted a bright inside, so I said I have to choose. And either I leave her completely dark, this young beautiful actress. We just said, well, she's completely drunk. Uh, she did ecstasy the night before. She wakes up. Why don't we go for both? Why don't we, why don't, but I, it's, it was not a creative idea. It started out as a technical problem and we fixed it by inventing something that would, that would uh, use it. And I, we're both very happy with that. Well, it's a masterful, masterful. So because the effect that it has is, is it puts you for, in a wide shot directly in, in the point of view of the subject that's in the shot. I want to talk a little bit about Child Star. <laughs> um, you know about this film. Uh, of course. <laughs> I, you know, the thing is, in, in, in English-speaking Canada, you know, one of the greatest heroes is Don. And, uh, you know, no, very few people do what, what he does, uh, as well as he do what he does, period. And um, so a great film, as, as the editor, Reg, Reg Harkema, told me, he said he, he always thought it was a better film than last night, but... Uh, he said, you know, one's about the end of the world. The other one's about, well, it's this boy star is going up to Canada as a driver and, you know, it, just, you know, it doesn't necessarily commercially connect. But um, that being said, just tell us about, like, you know, you're making a movie about Hollywood. Yeah. A little bit. About a, a, a farm league to Hollywood. Yeah, yeah. Look, I work hard. I read scripts every day. And when I come in this trailer, I want a relaxing environment and I don't want to waste my time reading. I'm not your servant, Taylor. What do you think a chauffeur is? I'm not reading this book. All right, pick another. It's cheating. If I'm the teacher, you do the reading. I don't think so, dude. Pardon me? You'll do whatever I tell you to do. Or what? Or you're fired. How nice of you to join us. My name is Isaac Fitzpatrick. I'm the president of Taylor's agency. We have reason to believe you've come into contact with our client. Nurse? Nurse? Tell us where the boy is, and I'm prepared to deal with you here and now. The famous child actor is missing. This claim there is no reason to suspect the foul play at this point, but we have learned that the in Los Angeles have been contacted. Began the yeah. yeah. The only Hollywood aspect I had to deal with was the studio. You know, we shot in the studios in Toronto where the green the White screen House. and the yeah, that's true. Yeah, the green screen stuff, and uh, but also the White House. Right. The, 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 the movie they're, they're shooting <laughs> the takes place in the White, White House. House. <laughs> and there's two studios with the White House, like uh, Oval Office and all yes. that. Yeah. So to me, uh, problem I have with that is I, I. I'm, I read the American cinematographer for a couple of years, you know, but I'm not into the making of films. I don't watch, uh, I don't study how films are made. I'm not really. You wouldn't be watching this interview, is what you're saying. I would, would not be watching this interview. <laughs> precisely what I'm saying. Maybe I will now. <laughs> no, 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 not at all, not at all. I have seen I films about cinematographers it, it, once it, it, in a while. Once in a while, like yeah. But I'm not a, 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 a cinematography buff, you know? Yeah. So let's talk, let's talk a bit about in, in Incendie. Yeah. First of all, 
the things that I, well, first of all, it's a completely compelling, engrossing movie. Phenomenal performances. Uh, one of the, most, the greatest parts about it is watching these actors who, you know, although some of them may be, may be stars in Quebec, you know, you're watching, you just see these tremendously, you know, almost European performances. Um, it shows us Montreal. It shows us the Middle East. Significantly, majority of the film in the Middle East. Jeanne, le Lothaire Lebel te remettra une enveloppe. Cette enveloppe est destinée à votre père. Retrouve-le et remets-lui cette enveloppe. Simon, le notaire te remettra une enveloppe. Cette enveloppe est destinée à votre frère. As-tu de la famille là-bas Des contacts C'est ridicule, Neve. Tu viens d'apprendre que A, ton père est vivant, et que B, tu as un autre frère. Ce qui est ridicule, c'est que tu remettes en question ce qui est inéluctable. Tu dois savoir. Sinon, ton esprit ne sera jamais en paix. Ça te prend un point de départ. Mon père est mort pendant la guerre, à Daresh. Ça, c'est la variable inconnue de l'équation. On ne commence jamais par la variable inconnue. Ma mère vient d'un village qui s'appelle Derom, de Fouad. If I'm not mistaken, I didn't. I, I thought that you did something brilliant, and, and you and Denis did something brilliant, which was the flashbacks. Normally, in so many movies, you know, oh, we have to have a look for the flashbacks. We gotta have a look for the flashbacks. Got you know, we'll pump the contrast up. We'll pump them down. If it's ray, you know, the, it's it's way up. If it's you know, it's way desaturated. It's black and white. It's just you know, this to me felt like it was almost like seamless. No, we did nothing special with flashbacks. I mean, the film is constructed in such a deconstructed way. Everything is a flash forward, a flashback, or you never know when, when is the present really. So we couldn't, we didn't, we didn't do anything for flash. Everything was shot the same way. The approach it was exactly the opposite of Maelstrom, I would say, in the sense that it's so much more naturalistic. I'm not trying to make significant or beautiful images with the way I'm filming but I'm trying to choose the right subjects. I'm not crazy about huge setups or big shots, you know. I'm, I want to film the subject in the correct manner. And we decided to, we, we thought what we have to do for this film is shoot low contrast, uh, very naturalistic. We're going to shoot in bright suns that I won't be able to control, so we can't push the contrast. The new, my new idea is that if you give a contrast palette that is very strong to start out with, you have to maintain it all along. You have to always keep it. If you start very, very, with a very smooth uh, contrast ratio, you start to film like that. My friend Sarah Michara, which is a DP here, is a big fan of Savidais, and she introduced me to this type of, I mean, when I watch her films, they start off and I go, oh my God, there's, this is so flat, you know? <laughs> this is so goddamn flat. And by 10 minutes into the movie, my eye is used to this contrast ratio, and if you want to mark a scene, with, make it more dramatic or make it more, then you just have to pump up a little bit of lighting or contrast in, in, uh, in post, and it, it really gets you really strongly. So that's my new thing now, you know? It's, it's not about flashing, flashing, all always like, it's not about doing three kings or something like that. Uh -huh, it's really like, uh -huh. It's really a, a trying to be, I'm trying to be much more subtle and reproduce reality, realistic uh, lighting situations, but shoot, frame correctly and shoot f and really control the sets and really control the time of day I'm going to shoot. Yep. And, and, and that came at the same time when I discovered 5219 Kodak film stock, the best stock Kodak has ever made. And it's too bad because now it's dying. It's, I'm shooting my last film with it, I'm sure, next week. And Kodak really went all the way to the, it's the best technology, you know. They, they really went all the way to the, they, they, what they had at the end was a fantastic, beautiful stock. And so I shot, uh, the, the big decision in, in, in uh, the photography of Essanzi was not lighting, except everything that we did that took, took place in the, uh, that normally takes place in, in, takes place in Lebanon, but that we shot here like the interiors that we shot here, then I had to light because I, had, I needed sun, you know, so now I had big setups with 18Ks and blah, blah, blah. But over there, I never took out something bigger than a 4K. Almost no lighting. And when you were shooting outside, yes. was it just... 
I was just covering the actress, you know, with big steady cam shots. I was just yeah, covering the actress. walking through actress. ruins yeah. and following along. Just covering a, the, the actress with something, but I filtered correctly in the camera and I pulled a lot. I pulled the film stock. The big thing that uh, oriented the cinematography was the colorist. She was a painter, Charlotte Mazingi. I'm doing another film with her, she's in France. And she influenced all the colors of the set. We wanted everything to be brown and, and, and sandy-like colors and stuff like that. That was our palette. She came in and said, well, guys, you have to put blues in certain spots. It's Otherwise, funny because the blue really does jump out, you know, the, the blue yes. of the sky. And it, it, there is a certain paleness to the sand and to the earth that, you know, so you're saying that was the colorist. Anyway, so, and another thing we, we did is I shot fire. I thought this film should be about, about uh, uh, la cendre, you know, when you have fire, what, what's left after a fire? Um, oh, you mean ash? Or? Ash. Yeah, yeah. So we filmed the ashes and we sent it to the colorist and we, I said, how, what, how does ash respond? What do we see? What kind of colors are there in ash? And actually the blues come out in ash when you take a piece of wood. Uh -huh. So we analyzed a bit of what ashes look like. Ashes of wood, you know, burnt wood. Yeah. And uh, because I had this feeling that after being to Lebanon when we scouted, we shot in Jordan, but we scouted in Lebanon because that's where it actually takes place without us saying about it, telling about it. And I noticed everywhere where bombs explode, you know, you get this, this bl black, black on surfaces, on, on, uh, on facades of buildings and stuff like that, all black, but very, very matte black, very, very matte. And that just kept on coming back in the pictures I took over there. I said, we gotta, we gotta, it's about incendie, it's about the war, and we gotta get this black everywhere. With the art department, we, they, they did that. They did a lot of burnt places, and it's not, it doesn't come out so much, but that was a part of the photography also. Andre Turpin, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. Fabulous to have you.